It's great to be here. Uh, I just remember that my first book that I wrote, uh, it's called The Way of the Jaguars. So I, uh, I understand that you guys have the, have the Jaguars too, so I'm really happy to see you. I have a little office that I work in the basement of my house. I have all kinds of Jaguars all over the place uh, for inspiration. And uh, I, I picked the Jaguar, you know, originally because it's such a, it's such a neat animal, you know. And uh, uh, the, the, what the book talked about was sort of like seeing, seeing the truth for what it is. And the jaguars had these eyes that could see, uh, and that was my symbol uh, for that particular book. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the book that you're right that you are. That a lot of you are reading uh, the Memory of Light, and uh, uh, I hope we have some. Uh, we'll have some time for some questions, which I hope that uh, I hope that you will ask. And uh, but before we get to the Memory of Light, I thought it would be good for you to know just exactly what kind of what needs a person to become uh, an author, and uh, how do they decide to to do this uh, to do this thing that is called writing, and what does it entail, and how do you get there, and some of the mistakes that I've made along the way, uh, some of the obstacles that I've encountered. Uh, the kind of books that I write are are realistic books, you know, the kind of called realistic fiction, which means that they're stories. That could actually take place. That that were that are believably belie that are believable. That could be that could be true. That could happen to any one of you. Uh, all of my characters are are young people between the ages of between 14, you know, and 18. Usually they're like 16 to 18. Uh, all of my characters have been Mexican American characters, except for like uh, in the last book that I wrote. It's about a brother and a sister who are just Mexican, you know, who lived in Mexico and who may be making their way over to the United States. Um, but, so this is realistic fiction that is kind of geared uh, toward, towards young people. And so how does a, an old man like myself, you know, I'm 64 years old, how is a person like that able to get into the minds of, um, or portray the minds of a young person? You know, I portray, uh, some, of my, some of my characters are girls, like Vicky in The Memory of Light, uh, some of my characters have, have mental disabilities. Like, uh, another book that I wrote, Marcelo in the Real World. Marcelo has a form of autism. Uh, so how does a person kind of become another person? You know, you have to kind of you have you have to kind of learn how how to think like somebody else in order uh, in order to write. Um, I have a little granddaughter. Her name is Charlotte. Six, six years old. And what she likes to do, she has these little things called Playmobiles, you know, little people. And they sell these Playmobiles in, in different settings, you know, in a hospital setting. There's a bed. There's all kinds of things. And so she takes these little people and they kind of talk to each other, you know. Uh, and she, in, in one second she's like this little people, and another second she's like this other little one. And they're doing little things. And if you probably, if you remember when you were a little kid, you used to do that too, probably. You know, you used to imagine that you were somebody else, uh, and you in in the games that you were playing. Uh, and somewhere along the line, as you grow up, it suddenly becomes not cool to to uh, to do that anymore. And and that and you stop pretending. But we also kind of have we also have we all have that ability to imagine what it is to be somebody else. You know, uh, imagine what it is to have somebody. Uh, lose somebody or, or you know so you kind of put yourselves in the minds of somebody else and that is kind of that's the essential quality of being an author uh, but you know but how do you get it you know sometimes I kind of look at my life and say you know where did this come from where did this ability to pretend to be somebody else come from or where did this uh, enjoyment for writing come from uh, and I start back you know in Mexico when I was uh, where I was born uh, and I, you know, I look back and I said, you know, I think, well, maybe it started with the fact that my mother was a, was a single mother. Uh, she made, you know, she was going out with somebody that she thought she was going to marry. She got pregnant, the guy didn't marry her. And I, you know, uh, she became a single mother. In those days, it was very, it's a very shameful thing to be, uh, to, to become pregnant and, and not being married. So my grandfather sent her to another city uh, when she began to show that she was pregnant so that she could um, deliver me over there and give me up for adoption 
and then come back and, every, you know, and everybody would say, well, she was away on a trip and nobody knew what happened. <laughs> so um, that's what happened. I mean, I, it's the only thing that, that's different is really that she changed her mind and decided not to, uh, not to give me up for adoption. And so she came back despite the fact that, you know, people were talking about her and they discovered that she had made this mistake and it was a shameful thing. And I often think that, you know, growing up for uh, that period of time when we went, went when with just a single mother without a father in a situation where, where, where people were kind of like, you know, Oops, look, she, 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 you know, she did this and that, that that kind of feeling of, of a little bit of shame, you know, that little feeling like you were a little bit different, like you didn't quite belong, you know, you think of the word for, for a child who is, who, uh, who doesn't have a father and a mother, it's called, um, illegitimate, you know, it, he's an illegitimate, you know, it, uh, it's, uh, it sort of almost sounds like undocumented, you know, it's like, you're not quite, you're not quite part of the accepted, uh, or accepted society. So I often, I often think that, 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 those, those early years, there must have been in, in me kind of a, a sense of not, of not belonging and kind of a yearning to kind of be, to belong and to be, and to be fully accepted that, I carried on uh, through life, and that somehow, uh, when I was able to, when I was able to write, allowed me to put myself into into characters. Kind of felt, kind of felt the same way. I was fortunate that when I was when I was six years old, there was this man that was traveling from Mexico who met my mother, uh, and and uh, and married her and adopted me. And his name was Charles Stork. So that's why I have this last name Stork that doesn't sound like very you know like a very Mexican name. But he decided to bring us to the United States, and we moved to uh, we moved to El Paso, Texas, and there again occurred you know that other the second time in my life where, where there's a situation of not of not quite belonging. You know, I didn't know I didn't know any English, so we came in on a uh, maybe it was a June I think, and I had to start school in September, so there really wasn't enough time to learn English, and uh, you know showed up at a public school uh, in the sixth grade really not knowing what was going on, you know, and kind of immediately being sent back to the, to the fifth grade. Um, it was a school where, um, where they still, in those days, if you spoke Spanish in the, in, the, in the playground, they would take you to the principal's office, and they would whack you in the behind with a little board that had little holes in it. Uh, so that was kind of like an, ad, you know, imagine what happens when, when you, you know, you're, you're growing up in a, in a culture where, you speak a certain language and, and you're kind of like accustomed to it and all of a sudden it's different so uh, and again you know that feeling of not of not belonging so I think that 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 also kind of contributes eventually to trying to find to, ex to find a way to express those things and, and in my case it was uh, it was to writing um, but I was I was lucky enough um, to live to have a who have an adopted father who taught me yeah, so, so I had a sense of what it was like to have a father and a mother at the same time. Uh, I only had him for a few years. You know, he died in an automobile accident when I was 13. So it was just my mother and myself and trying to decide whether we should go back to Mexico and we decided to stay. Uh, and uh, we ended up living in these uh, subsidized housing in El Paso, Texas, which is basically, you know, we call them the they Let Up Projects. It's, um, it's a kind of a dangerous place. And I remember one of the things that I that I was that I was that I learned to do very quickly was to, to remain under the radar. You know, uh, at 13 you sort of begin to sort of realize some of the things that you like to do and not like to do, and you know you like to read and I like to do. Uh, uh, I wasn't into a lot of the other things that other kids were, and so in order to you know those are the kind of things you didn't want to show anybody that you that you uh, that you like to do because it was. Uh, uh, it would make you. It would get you noticed, and, and getting noticed was not uh, was not a good thing. Uh, I went to I went to this high school. It was a Catholic school. Uh, it was an all boys school, and the reason I got I got to go there, even though there was a tuition that was that needed to be paid, so I got a scholarship because when in church, uh, I was good at uh, at reading the scriptures. You know how you would read. You'd be a lay person. You read the scriptures, and you would make the announcements. And the priest noticed that I could do that, and I didn't get nervous in front of people. Uh, and so he said that he could, I could, he could get me a scholarship to the school to be on the debate team. Or to, and and, um, and this, in, in debate, basically you go to different different schools 
and compete. You know, and sometimes you have a speech that you give. Sometimes it's just a you have a topic that you discuss the pros and cons. One of the favorite topics at that time is should we should we be in the in the war in Vietnam? And you know, someone said sometimes you would get to, to fight for the uh, on behalf of yes, we should be, and sometimes it was against. Um, but I remember sort of the, 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 I was still in those days, you know, that the school kind of kept rank of, of who you, where you stood in the school, you know, depending on, your, on, on how, what, how your grades were. And the first time that the, the report card came out, there were 114 kids, and I was the 100 and number tw 112. You know? uh, and I still sort of remember the time when kind of a little light bulb went on my, went inside my, on top of my head that, that said that it was, it was okay for me to be smart, and um, it happened, you know, that that, that as, as a boys school, the only opportunities that you had to, to meet girls were in these other tournaments that you go to, so that was kind of a good thing about that, you know. So and, and in one of those tournaments, I really liked this girl, her, I still remember her name, her name is Becky Dugan. In my eyes, she was, you know, she was very beautiful, uh, and I, after a few tournaments, and I kind of worked out my nerve to, uh, to ask her out, you know, we were having a dance in our school, and um, she knew me because we kind of competed against each other. So, you know, I wasn't really a stranger. I find out that she worked at this Dairy Queen, and so on a Saturday I showed up, and you know, I pretended that I wanted a hamburger, and then I pretended that I wanted a milkshake, and then I pretended that I wanted something else, you know, and kind of like kind of working up my nerve. And so finally I decided, what the heck, Francisco? Are you a are you a worm or are you a man? You know. So I went up and I said, no, Becky, uh, we have this dance. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to come to it if you don't want to. But if, if you ever, if you were interested in going to this dance, would, would you like to come, you know? And, and to my surprise, she said yes. And so um, I was like kind of floating in the air, you know, walking out of there. You guys probably never experienced anything like this, right? <laughs> so the following Saturday, you know, I, I collected cans so that I could take her out for a hamburger afterwards. And I, I got a, a friend of mine who had, a, who had a car to drive us. And I waxed this car and I vacuumed it. And the following Saturday, I was uh, I was cleaning his car for one for the, like the 13th time. And, and the phone rang. And it was Becky. And uh, you know, she says, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't go to the dance with you. And I said, why? She said, well, my parents have this rule, you know, I, they don't let me go out with Mexicans. So it was like, the reason I tell you this story is, is for two reasons. One of them is because it was the first time that I realized that this image that I had of myself was not exactly the same image that other people are having of me. You know, it was like a little light bulb that went into my head. Oh my God, these people are not looking at me the same way that I see myself. You know, I saw myself as a respectful, uh, nice, you know, kid. And I don't know how the, their parents never met me in their in their lives, so I'm not exactly sure how they were seeing me, but it wasn't the same way that they were that I was seeing myself. So that was a moment of illumination. And the other one was that really that there was a, there was anger and sadness that that came out of this, and in a way that 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 anger kind of made me uh, made me kind of give up this 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 desire to kind of hide you know, who I was. And, and so I just kind of let it go. Uh, and, and I decided to study, you know, uh, in a way it was, it was the anger that, 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 that said, you know, I'm going to show you kind of the kind of thing, you know, I'm going to show you who I am. Uh, and I don't recommend that kind of anger, you know, uh, for a very long time. But in certain cases, uh, it really was really helpful. You know, I, I kind of compare it to like those, those rockets that are sent into space, the, the propulsion comes from the bottom part that detaches itself after a while. If it didn't detach itself, the whole thing with the astronaut on top would blow up. So the anger for me was this kind of like this rocket that sent me into my room every day, you know, a, a, in, after school, to the library to study. Uh, and what happened after a while is that I, you know, the anger left, but the enjoyment of, uh, that I got from it uh, was, remained, and so that's when I discovered that I that I like to read, uh, that I like to write, that if, even if I worked, you know, if I worked a little bit hard on, on the math problems and I memorized them, that I could get those two. Uh, and the next time the report cards came out, uh, instead of being 112, I was I was number four, 
Uh, and, and that's the way it remained, you know, throughout my high school years. And what that happened is that allowed me to get a scholarship into a college, another Catholic school, uh, where I had the tuition, you know, fully paid. Uh, and and, it, and it, it became sort of, it, it, it started sort of the, the desire to be to be a writer and to and to uh, and to align myself with professors and courses that would teach me they would teach me how how to write uh, from from the four years in college there was this there was this fellowship that was given across the nation to maybe fifty people uh, and they would pay their uh, tuition and living expenses to go anywhere in the, in the, to, become, to study in graduate school. And I got one of those, and I was able to go to Harvard, uh, where I spent four years uh, studying to be a, uh, a professor. Uh, but I still wanted to be a writer, and I found it very hard to kind of do the kind of writing that, that Harvard wanted me to do and do the kind of writing that I wanted. So then I went to law school you know, for three years. I went to Columbia Law School and became a lawyer. Um, and there's another, there's another moment there where the sense of, when I graduated from law school, I, sat, I had all these classmates of mine who were getting interviews with these very prestigious law firms. Uh, and I kind of wanted to be like them. You know, you know that sense of not belonging that I told you about when I was a little, when I was little? Well, it kind of you know, never leaves you. And sometimes it makes you kind of want to, to belong to, to do certain things where, you know, you wouldn't, that are not yourself. And so I applied for these jobs, and I got a prestigious job in a, in a law firm working as a lawyer uh, in Boston. And soon I found out, you know, that after after a few years, it became clear that I didn't fit in there. That the kind of that the kind of person that they wanted was was had a brain that thought a lot faster than than mine went. Even my, though my brain is good, it's just it's just not that fast, you know. So you have to find the right place uh, where who you are could fit. So how we got to writing is when I was 40 years old, even though I had wanted to be a writer since I was your age, there I was 40 years old and I had not written a damn thing. So, you know, after a while you're gonna have to stop fooling yourself. Either you're going to be the person that you want to be or you're not. And so at 40 years old, after losing yet another job, because I had lost after two years, I either got fired or I left or something else. After 40 years, you know, after losing another job, I decided to write this book that I told you about called The Way of the Jaguar. It took me five years to write, and probably another five years to finally get it published. But uh, a small university press picked it up, and maybe a hundred copies were sold. I probably bought 50 of them. But what that, what that did is that um, it got me an agent. You know, somebody said, uh, it represents authors, says the next time you write a book, uh, I will represent you. And once you have somebody like that in your court, the publication process became, becomes much, e much easier. The Memory of Life, which is the book that you guys read, is a book about a young girl who suffers from, uh, from depression. And how that fits into my life is because I think that the first time, even though I didn't know it at the time, the first time that I experienced depression was around maybe 14, 15 years old, about two years after my adopted father died. My mother had to go back to Mexico, so I went to live uh, with this priest that I told you about and eventually got me the scholarship. And he had this room in the back of his, uh, uh, of his house that was full of statues of, of different saints. And in there, they had like a little army cot. And it was one of the loneliest experiences I think I've ever had. Uh, you know, you're, you're filled with the statues, your mother is gone, your father is gone. And I didn't know it at the time, but something, I think something happened in my, in, 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 in my head that made it very, uh, that had all the symptoms of depression even though I didn't know it at the time. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't until many, many years later when I was writing this book that I was able to go back and, 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 and relive in a way those experiences that I had as a young person. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to write a book that was more about the recovery from depression because recovery is something that I had been doing since those 14 years old. Uh, living with it, learning how to live with it, learning how to go back, get, get out of bed and go to work in the morning, even though I, that's the last thing I wanted to do. All those tricks and tools that I had figured out you know, during those years to do that, I put into this book about this young girl who was suffering from depression and who was trying to make it out of there uh, 
uh, life, trying to find out a, a way to live. Uh, and Vicky, uh, uh, the story with Vicky begins after a, after a suicide attempt. And the suicide attempt is something that I had experienced myself too at Harvard. You know, that Harvard was a, uh, again, an environment that was so different from Texas. Uh, uh, again, a, a place where, where, you know, you just, it was very hard to find that sense of belonging. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's an experience of, 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 of total, uh, of total loss, uh, that I went through and somehow was able to, to make it through. Uh, so all of those things, I was, I was, I wanted to write a book that was, uh, that was hopeful, you know, because too many books about depression kind of concentrate on this spiral, you know, kind of what causes depression, bullying, abuse, and so forth. So what I really wanted to do was create a sense of like the depression is not necessarily caused by big trauma. It can just, you know, just kind of happen to people, ordinary people living ordinary lives. Uh, and that's what I, uh, that's what I concentrated on in this, in, in this book. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that if this book was ever read by a person who was depressed, that the, uh, that the book would make somehow uh, inspire that person to keep on going. So it's a book that took about four years to write because I wanted to get it right. Uh, I would write one draft and it just didn't seem right. For example, one example it was one draft, uh, Vicky falls in love with one of the characters in, in, the, in the group. Uh, and there's kind of, a, kind of a romantic relationship. And I had never written kind of a love story before. And so it was kind of, it was a really beautiful love story. I think my, my publisher was kind of glad that I was finally putting something in my books that might sell a few books, you know, because that's what kind of interests some people. And then I looked at the I looked at the draft, and there was something about it that just didn't seem right. I mean, you know why? Because a lot of people with depression are not fortunate enough to find somebody to fall in love with, and even if they do fall in love with someone, I mean, that's not necessarily the end of their depression. So it wasn't really right to have a uh, to have a salvation uh, of someone uh, with this illness. Uh, to come out of uh, out of depression, um, so the, the the artist in me who wanted to sell a good book and who wanted to create a, a good story said, "Write this story." But there was this other part of me, you know, the person in me, uh, the person who had lived certain things, who knew what was right and, and what was true and what was not, and that part uh, influenced the book to go into a different direction. So that was this, that's the story of the of the memory of light. Um, there are a lot of things about about the books that I write that are based not so much on, on things that happened to me, but things that I experienced. For example, I wrote a book about two um, two girls who were very ambitious. One of them was very smart and was uh, got a scholarship into uh, Stanford University to be a doctor, but her mother is very sick in a coma. And so there's this kind of like a, a pool, you know, should she, should she go to Stanford and be this great doctor, you know, should she, should, 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 should she listen to her ambitions or should she stay with her family? What are her obligations towards her home? And that's something that I experienced when, when I went to Harvard. Uh, my mother was by herself, it was just me and, me and her, and she wanted me to, to go. But I, had, I felt this like, like, what's more important, you know, to be with your mother, or to do this incredible opportunity that is offered to you, uh, and I believe you know that, that that's the kind of uh, uh, that's the kind of um, conflict that a lot of us here in this room are going to feel at some point or another. You know, whether to to because we're, cause we're pulled, we're needed at home, you know, and and but at the same time we're also like pushed <coughs> to be our best and to find and to find what we what we can do we can do best. I was lucky enough to kind of recognize what I was what I was good at. You know, I, I was good at and, and to, I was good at pretending to be other people, and to find a career that I, that was finally I was able to uh, I was able to express that. Uh, and so you you guys are going to have choices pretty soon about what you're going to do, what are you what you're going to do with your lives. You know, and I think that I always think about the three things that you need to consider in making sure that you make the right choice. You know, first you gotta pick something that you're good at. Because then being good at is, is when you look at yourself and what comes easy to you. 
You know, each one of us, I think, has certain gifts. For me, for example, when I was a kid, uh, talking to uh, uh, talking in front of people was easy. Uh, so, what are you good at? And then, um, the second thing would be: uh, is it useful? I mean, is it is it is, is it something that can help other people? And is it something that you enjoy? I mean, sometimes you're good at something that you don't enjoy, and sometimes you are good and at something that is not necessarily useful for all those things, but I think useful to others. And when all of those three things come together, um, then, then you have something that, that, uh, that I think can, can give you some kind of fulfillment uh, in your life. I'm very happy now. I, I, I retired from practicing law about two years ago. So um, the, the, book, the last book that I wrote was wrote as, uh, I wrote as when I was fully retired. Um, and uh, but all the other books I wrote when when I was being a lawyer, so I had to like get up in the morning at four o'clock in the morning and write for two hours before I went to become a lawyer um, uh, and do my things as a as a lawyer. I had to do it during weekends, um, and so it was it was the reason I did it is because if I if the writing was a gift and the gift is not somehow if I didn't find a way to express it, then I think that. That I would be unhappy, and, and that somewhere or other I would it would come it could, it would come back uh, it would come back to haunt me. So I'm going to stop here for a few seconds, and then I, hopefully you guys will have uh, will have some questions. You can ask me about um, uh, about anything, my life, my writing, the books that you read. There has to be a question someplace. Yes. Pardon me. Um, well, so I, I wrote it from the point of view of Vicky. So the other possibility would be to write it from the point of view of a of a, of a young man, for example. Uh, so I wrote I wrote it from the point of view of Vicky because it gave me a little bit of distance. You know, when I was writing, I didn't want to like feel depressed again, like sometimes I do. And so I thought that maybe by creating a female character that I would be, uh, I would think of her as a character and I wouldn't see myself necessarily as a character. Sometimes when I write about a boy, you know, you kind of, it's, it's very hard not to like put yourself in the shoes and pretend, you know, see yourself as a character. And so that distance was, uh, was good for me to write in uh, for Vicky. Um, but one of the other characters in the book was Gabriel and he was, I had, um, I had to make sure that, I mean, I was very interested in Gabriel, and sometimes, he, you know, he, I had to remind myself that it wasn't his story this time, it was really, it was really Vicky's. Any more questions? Yes. Did you get emotionally attached or feel sympathy for any characters in the writing process? Did I get emotionally attached or feel, feel sympathy? Yeah, for any of the characters. I mean, you always kind of, you kind of love your characters, especially like these are four kids that you do get, a, you get attached in the sense that they're part of you. You know, each one of those kids represents in a way a different part of my personality. You know, like Vicky with the depression, you have Crazy Mona with like a bipolar disorder, you have EM kind of real tough, you know, and, and, and you have Gabriel with like his religion. So yes, they're, I mean, they're all, they're all a little bit of, Part, they're all a little part of me, so so I, I get uh, I get attached. But being attached doesn't mean that I ha I can't like make things happen to them. You know, if it's if it if it'll, uh, if I mean if they need to suffer, I'm gonna make them suffer. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Opportunities like this to uh, to tell people about you know some of the things that I went through. Uh, and and, 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 and and probably some of those things that I went through are probably and could be some of the things that you are going through. Uh, and so I'm not sure it's so much a question about uh, it's not so much a question about strength, but it's more like about about what once you decide what your life is about and what your purpose is, then you just have to kinda of, and, and if that purpose entails kinda of being helpful to others, then you're gonna do what it takes to, to do that. You know what I mean? Even if even if you feel very vulnerable or, or not strong enough inside, it doesn't really matter. You know, you're just gonna you're just gonna have to you're just gonna have to do a, do a, 
to do it, you know. So it's I feel I feel like this is I believe in this thing called a vocation, which is kind of like a calling, which is like this is what you're meant to do. And and sometimes some of us discover what that is. And once you do that, you know, it takes a long time. It took me a long time to figure that out. But once you discover that this is what you're meant to do, then you almost don't have any choice. You're not gonna be happy unless you do it. You know, that's the way kind of things line up. That's a good question though. Thank you very much. Who's my favorite character in the book? I like, you know, at different times, and there's a little bit of them that I, I like. I, one of the characters that really surprised me was E.M. a lot. And I ended up liking him a lot more as I, as I wrote, you know, because he was kind of like a, a non-nonsense kind of guy. He didn't want to, he didn't want Vicky to feel sorry for herself and he was against any kind of, any kind of self-pity. Uh, and he was also kind of like a, an angry guy who had a lot of trouble kind of controlling his anger. Uh, and anger is something that, you know, that I struggle with. I mean, it, I, I realize how, I guess there's so many things in this world that make me angry, you know, and, and, and so, um, you have to find a way to turn that angry or anger around into something that's that's more creative. Uh, but Gabriel has a lot of my, you know, Gabriel's kind of kind of like a very religion religious, and so he has a lot of a lot of me also. Good, good question. What chapter is my favorite chapter in the book? Have you guys read the book yet? Raise your hand if you read the whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, now raise the hand. Now raise your hand if you're telling the truth. <laughs> so, how many people that are of the people who are, who are read the book and who are telling the truth. <laughs> How many people like this the chapter where they're in a raft in the river and uh, EM falls into the water? <laughs> so that's one of my that's one of my favorite chapters. Uh, I love the chapters with the, with 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 the doctor also, I think that the, with, with with Vicky. You know, one of the thing, one of the things that you struggle with as, as an author when you have a when when you have a, a book like this, where not a lot happens, right? I mean, you're in a hospital, uh, and, and and so what's going to happen in the hospital? Basically, there's just a lot of conversation that is going on. So how I how am I as an author going to kind of keep your interest, so that you don't like so that you keep on reading, right? If I were had like a if I had a plot where somebody gets killed and you're trying to find out who the killer is, one of the things that makes you turn the page is like who did it. But when you're like in the hospital, I mean, what is it? What is the suspense? So the only thing that I have going for me is for you to kind of like really like the characters and to want to like that you identify with them to such an extent that you want to keep on that you want to keep on reading. So, uh, so that's how that's how I created you know I created these type of characters because each one of them I hope would, would keep you interested in the in, in the book. Another question. Yes. What is your advice for somebody who is trying to um, who is trying to recover from depression? It's uh, a good one. I mean, I think that um, well, you know, depression is one is one of those things that that nobody understands why, but but talking about it helps. You know, nobody really understands how how talking about what you're feeling helps, but it happens, you know, it does. And so I think that one of the things that 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 I, that, that you do is, is you try to find somebody that you, that you trust, that you can just talk about, that, that's not going to like, uh, is not going to like look at you and, and, and say, you know, you're lazy or, or call you names for not wanting to go out with them or, you know, sometimes I think it's just somebody that'll that'll like do things with you that's comfortable just doing things without talking about it. Because a lot of times when you're depressed, you don't want to talk. But you know, just go like window shopping or go bowling or do something, you know. Um, but probably, I mean, what what Vicky what what, what works for Vicky in, in the book is really that she begins to kind of understand 
that some of these thoughts that she has when she's depressed, like the primary thought that you get when you're depressed is like, I'm not good enough, I'm not a good student, I'm lazy, I can't do this, you know, I'm so ugly, nobody likes me. I mean, all of these thoughts just kind of hit your head, and, and so you begin to believe them after a while, you know, and so, but it's not, it's the illness that's creating those thoughts. So, just like when you have a fever, you don't blame yourself for having a fever, it's just the illness that gives you that fever, right? But when you have those thoughts, you know, the ability to see, well, that's not me, you know, those thoughts are not necessarily me. That understanding is probably like the greatest understanding that you can get uh, in order to recover from depression. Because uh, if you believe those thoughts, then you ultimately end up hurting yourself or, or doing something like that. So you have to find a way to distance yourself from them. There's people in the back. I don't think I have. Yes. I'm sorry, what? What, it was, what character was the most uh, difficult to develop throughout the story? Um, what character was the most difficult to develop? I think that the, uh, uh, well, Gabriel, Gabriel was a very, was a very difficult character because Gabriel, Gabriel kind of hears voices and he hears voices that he thinks are, are from God, you know? And so are those voices really from God or is, is or is, or is Gabriel ill, you know? And I have to kind of kind of create this kind of this kind of balance where I didn't want to undermine or make fun of Gabriel's uh, faith faith beliefs, you know, uh, because in many ways I agree with them. But at the other time, but at the same time, I had to like I had to create a, you know this sense that this these voices could be could be an illness. So it was a very it was a very difficult uh, it was a very difficult balance to have. The other kind of character that was kind of hard was Vicky's father, because I wanted Vicky to be, you know, Vicky's father to be simple, kind of, not a bad guy. I didn't want him to be a bad guy, you know. And I know that sometimes he comes across as a little bit of a jerk, but I think most fathers know it as are jerks sometimes, right? So, and on occasion, even you know, I'm a father, so I know. But, but at the same, you know, I wanted, I wanted. I wanted, I wanted, I didn't want him to be a bad, per, a bad person, but at the same time, he doesn't quite understand depression and how and how it works. And and he's a man that that was has just kind of fully bought into this idea of uh, of being a success no matter what, you know, of competition, of 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 of, of beating the other the the, the other person. Uh, and so that's that's an attitude that I find very prevalent in our society, uh, and and so I wanted to, you know it was difficult to create that kind of attitude and at the same time not have people think of his of think of Vicky's father as a, a totally bad person. So that's that you know that balance that you have to choose, choose for 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 characters. What is it about an alf, about authors that you guys want to know? You know, you want to know that. That interests you. That uh, you, yes. How much money did you make? How much money did I make with the memory of light? <laughs> so what happens with the with the book is that it, it they give you a the, the publisher gives you kind of an advance, uh, and then uh, and then you get when the book begins to sell, uh, you don't get any you don't get any 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 percentage of the book. Until that that advance is uh, is paid, so for every uh, my contract with a, with a publisher calls for about like fifteen percent of of gross. You know, you know for every so every book so if a book is called if a book sells for fifteen dollars, uh, fifteen percent of that is about what? Maybe like a dollar seventy five. <laughs> so that's kind of how it works, you know. So so if I sell a lot of books, then then you make some money, but uh, you know you have to. And there are authors who are able to make a living just by selling books. I've never been able to make a living. I was fortunate to have to be a lawyer and to have a salary, you know, being paid. I got a, the last 15 years of my life. I worked for an affordable housing agency uh, who's, who did who, who built homes where people had low income, 
And so it was a great job because it wasn't too stressful. I got went in at eight, left at four, and I had a you know I had a paycheck, you know, so I didn't have to really worry about creating a book that would sell because I had this other way to, to make a living. Uh, but there are there are other people who who need to do that and you know have a hard time. And there are authors who just are incredibly fortunate and, and have very popular books that sell that sell quite a bit, you know. So um, I, I'm not, I, I, you know, if a book sells, that'd be that'd be wonderful. But what's important to me is that it reaches, you know, that it that it reaches people like uh, people like you, you know. So uh, I hope uh, I hope that that happens. Does my family have an impact? You know, I'm not. No, I don't. I don't tell my family. I don't share my family what I write until after I finish, like a first draft, because I want to make sure that it's my story. Uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, when I'm writing, like, I, like I'll consult with my my wife or my daughter if it's a female. You know, like a, like, a, like a girl question that I really don't know, and they usually like guide me to say, Dad, do not talk about makeup. Do not talk about how people dress. Just stay away from that kind of stuff. <laughs> so. But but no, I don't. I, I like I like the first draft to be my own story. So so I just uh, I stay away from you know from influencing, and then I then I share it with them, and then sometimes I go back and change things. They they've made some suggestions that have been very that I've changed that have been very helpful at that point. Um, but also kind of they kind of I think your family kind of worries about you a little bit. You know, like when they read something and they see something like oh this is this is like. What you're, what you're writing about here is really about what happened to you when you were a kid, you know. And, and so you kind of they know you so well that they can recognize you in the in the stories, you know. <laughs> yes. Have I ever considered using a pen name? Uh, no, no. I mean, I can barely sell enough books as it is, so <laughs> using a pen name is not going to get me. It's not going to get me too far. You know, the pendings are, if like I wrote a book that I was really kind of embarrassed about, which I would never do, you know. But let's say I wanted to just make some money, and I wanted to write, I would write this, I'd see, hmm, what if I write about these Mexican vampires who are in a love triangle? <laughs> you think that that would sell? So then I would use a pen name. <laughs> More questions? I don't know how much time do we have. Is it almost time? Are we on? What, four more minutes. Come on, this is your chance. Somebody asked me like an embarrassing question. Pardon me? A biography? My life is kind of boring, don't you think? <laughs> okay, why did I why did I name the book The Memory of Light? That's a really good question. There's a poem in the book that where the title comes from. It's a poem that Vicky writes. And the reason I named it The Memory of Light is because there are times in your life when there's uh, there's so much darkness, really, you, that you cannot see the future. You cannot see tomorrow. There's just you don't want tomorrow. You just cannot see anything good coming at you. And the only thing that will save you is not the future, but the past. Just remembering, remembering something good that happened to you, remembering somebody that was not that was good to you. So that's kind of like you know the memory of life kind of pushes you forward sometimes. So, so that, I think I want to end with those uh, with those very inspiring words. Thank you very much for coming, guys. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.